Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. My name is Christopher Rocchio. I am the author of the Sun Your Science Fantasy series from Daw Books and a seven-year veteran of the publishing industry. And uh, we are back for another episode of the Round Table. And this time I am joined by my friends R.R. Verdi and Shauna Lawless. Ronnie, Shauna, why don't you introduce yourselves? You do first, Ronnie. Uh, oh, okay, fair enough. Uh, I'm R.R. Verdi. Uh, I've been writing for about like 10 years now. I'm best known for my urban fantasy series, The Grave Report, and I recently just debuted with an epic fantasy series from Tor, uh, The First Binding, which is book one of Tales of Tremaine, and that's like a Silk Road giant epic fantasy picaresque. Awesome. Uh, and Shauna? Okay, so I'm Shauna Lawless. Um, I um, write historical fantasy. So my first book, The Children of Gods and Fighting Men, is a historical fantasy set in 10th century Ireland. And so it's about Irish history, Irish mythology, and uh, about war and kind of conflicts of power. Awesome. And I have put links to both Ronnie and Shauna's books in the description, everybody, if you would like to go check them out and uh, grab a copy because, of course, you can't just read my stuff, right? It's a few months before uh, <laughs> War Book 5 comes along. So... You know, go and go and check those out. And what I want to do uh, for this episode, right, is talk about writing from history because this is something that each of us is doing in kind of different ways. And of course, science fiction and fantasy in particular are you know very closely tied to the historical record, even if only in the broadest possible you know sense. And so I thought that talking about the different ways that we've sort of incorporated history into our writing, because uh, of course I've done, you know, the sort of post-historical setting, you know, with the far future, but, you know, very much attached to uh, history and myth. Ronnie, you built like a secondary world based on South Central Asia. Sean, you're literally working in medieval Ireland, right? So you're much closer than, than either of us, right? And I thought that difference would be really interesting. And what I want to do too, uh, so the chat doesn't get discouraged, is I think we're just going to talk about it for, you know, the first... 30 minutes or so and then we'll take questions because the last couple i've done this i have you know i've stepped on you know poor dave butler and you know dan and, and folks to just try and answer questions so we're gonna we're gonna get to the chat at the end but if you have questions for us do leave those you know in the chat because we will uh you know be getting to those as as we go but i guess the um the first question that i sort of wanted to talk about is how much was uh you know history right just in the broadest sense on your mind when you started this is that where you got you did you want to start from the history itself or do you have like another idea, like a story beat or a character and the history was sort of a secondary thing that you arrived at? So how did you, how did you shape the story? Um, For me, uh, I definitely started with the history of mythology and then the history of authors who've come before me who were history focused, which sounds weird, but it was kind of like reverse engineering, I guess, the epic itself, because that's part of what uh, I'm trying to do with Tales of Tremaine since it's focused on storytelling. I'm um, tacking the evolution of like the epic story, going all the way back down to the prose Edda. You've got Beowulf, um, the Mahabharata, Raman, uh, the Rig Veda. And then if you dial it back up, you can see how Tolkien tried to, when he was creating Middle Earth, went to pre Arthurian British mythology and European mythology because he was kind of done with everything's Arthurian inspired. And he went back to the Norse epics. So for me, when I tackled the history and world building, I was like, a lot of these cultures first did it through fable, folklore, and mythology. Uh, they didn't really do it through actual existing history. You know, it was pantheons of gods that explained how the world was created. And then their society revolved around those beliefs, um, how they treated with each other, um, what they valued, I guess, as like attributes in different people, bravery, honesty, um, what's permitted. And I allowed my world to sort of build off of that. If I dial it back to South Asian roots and create a new secondary world, let it evolve. How does it change in this new world? How do those stories and mythology then shape the history of this world prior to where it's at in its present point? Um, which is why in my series, you'll see there's a lot of nesting stories that tackle mythological stories that shape people's beliefs and cultures in this world. Awesome. Uh, Shauna? Well, um, I suppose I, I read a lot of fantasy and I had noticed a lot of occasions where I was reading a book where I could see Irish mythology in it. So for like Lord of the Rings uh, that Ronnie was talking about, uh, you know, uh, Sauron is very strongly linked to Baylor of the Evil Eye, which is a character from Irish mythology. Uh, the Undying Lands seems quite similar to Tiranog, which is a which is in Irish mythology too. And I found that in lots of books, not just Tolkien. And so as I was reading, I really enjoyed that Irish history and mythology had inspired all these fantasy books. But 
I really actually then wanted to have Ireland as the setting and not just the inspiration. And to actually talk about Ireland a little bit within the story, um, because Ireland is very different to the rest of Europe in this period of history. The Romans never made it to Ireland. So like there's instantly like a huge difference there. And the Christianity that has come to Ireland isn't really as strongly set in, in people's belief systems. So the laws of Ireland haven't really changed or updated to account for the changes uh, in Christian law and doctrine, even though people have converted in Ireland. And so as I was doing more and more research about Ireland and history and mythology, I just really felt it was a period of time and a place that nobody knows much about. And a lot of the preconceived ideas about Ireland uh, are wrong or they're from a different era. So I just felt it was a it was a big opportunity to do something different. And then, of course, in all the Irish mythologies, they do link fantasy with uh, history. So a lot of our Irish stories like the Teen and like Finn McCool and Cahoolan, it is history and fantasy linked. So we have that sort of history anyway of, of fantasy and history being intertwined. So for me, almost then I, when I started to write the story, it came out and it felt very natural. Um, and I, because I knew the history so well and I know the mythology so well, it just kind of came together quite easily. Yeah, so was there a point at which you thought that this might be a book that you'd set in a secondary world then? Or was, so, or was Ireland like always the plan? Like, Ireland was always the plan for this book, not in other books that I had written previously, because the character of Gormla, who's uh, one of the queens in the, the story I wrote, I just had done a bit of research on, on her and wrote the first chapter, which is the prologue in my book, and it just just came out. Kind of and it just went from there. And then it, I, well, I did think possibly about trying to set it in a secondary world, just because I thought then it would be more epic fantasy as opposed to historical fantasy. But the Irishness of the characters and the conflicts between the different clans in Ireland and with the Vikings at the time, it all was just there. And I felt then by lifting it away and putting it into someone into somewhere else, it just didn't feel right. So mm. I just left it as it was and just hoped that maybe historical fantasy would be interesting to someone and I think I just was very lucky that all these mythological retellings uh, were suddenly getting very popular and historical fantasy is a subgenre that was suddenly having a little bit of a, a bit of a moment. Yeah no that's awesome. Ronnie was uh, conversely was there a point at which you thought maybe you'd set this on the actual Silk Road as opposed to the fantasy version? I don't think I've ever talked to you about this. Uh, no, you oh. haven't. And yeah. I thankfully the answer is no. Uh, I knew exactly what I wanted to do was very much in Tolkien's steps because um, he's a huge inspiration of mine. And I loved what he did by creating a new mythology inspired from, like Shauna was saying, also Irish mythology. I left that out, but it is very true. Um, just down to the symbolism of the trees he uses. Um, and I was like, South Asia doesn't have that right now. Uh, growing up, something that was really famously done with South Asian mythology is just retellings. We've been doing that for a very long time, but we haven't been doing new secondary worlds. Uh, it just didn't exist in the market as far as I saw. It's a lot of like retellings of the Mahabharata, especially. And I was like, well, since that exists, for me, it just made sense to find a new niche of like, where are our Lord of the Rings? Where are our like Stormlight archives and stuff and or Wheel of Time? And since the source was there, uh, it just made sense for me to like set it in the secondary world and let it evolve and hopefully create something that has a large enough breadth that it inspires other people to take a shot at it because no one's going to stop remaking the Mahabharata. Uh, God, I think it's gone for like eight different iterations of just a TV show in, in India, for the record. Like it just, it is oh, a guaranteed awesome. thing where they would just keep remaking it. They're like have four or five seasons, cool, done, two years go by, redo it. Because it's like the best-selling thing, right? It's like the yeah. I, I'm jealous because we still don't have a good adaptation of the Iliad over here just at all. Yeah, it yeah. just doesn't exist. Uh, no, it's funny. I laughed when you said "thankfully," right? Because like there are a couple story ideas I have that would be set in like I don't know ancient Rome or something, right? 
but I'm so scared to do that because of getting all the little micro details, mm -hmm. right? Which is, you know, maybe something we can talk about, but that's one of the reasons why when I started writing my own stuff, I wanted to do epic fantasy and a lot of the, the same vein that, that you're talking about, Ronnie, specifically. And um, I realized that I could go a lot farther with the symbolism and the subtext if I could explicitly call out, you know, Greek and Roman myths specifically. Yeah, there's a lot of that, of course, in Sun Eater, but, you know, uh, scripture and, you know, random things too, right? Like the references to like Sargon of Akkad and stuff like mm -hmm. that in the books. And uh, and I and I realized that I could by moving to the future that I was able to sort of you know pull from history like really really concretely as opposed to change the names of things right because people even if they've never like read you know Dante right and like maybe you have in school right have at least heard of it and they have like an idea and it feels automatically deep and you can kind of crib some of the deepness off of it by working with a uh, with real earth you know settings in in certain ways just because people have like vague notions it's sort of in their cultural memory. Um, but then you're like, you know, you're expected to keep, you know, the, the calendar straight, right? One of the writers I really admire is Tim Powers because he writes these sort of secret history stories, right? Well, he'll pick a period and he will, you know, he'll, you know, research was Lord Byron in Venice this month, right? No, damn, he can't be in the scene. And that's a level of detail that like sort of intimidates me as a writer. But Shauna, that's like presumably like sort of the sort of stuff you have to keep track of. Like, was there, you know, what did the, did the castle have a curtain wall, you know, or was it, you know, Mott and Bailey or whatever, right? And so did you actually like, get to go around to places you were writing about and do the actual on the ground researching and stuff? Well, yes, because I'm from Ireland. So uh, um, I've been to a lot of the places in the book. Uh, but the thing that, sort of worked in my favour is there isn't a huge amount of records for this period of time and it is pre the Norman invasion so there weren't any castles um, in Ireland at that stage so the the Duns and the Raths and the you know all the settings we only have like ar archaeological digs that would reference them and so because there wasn't a huge amount of uh, factual information there was a lot of leeway then to oh. to do what i not what i wanted but uh, i added like a lot of free reign shall we say while still still trying to make sure that the story was historically accurate but it's not like i don't know like authors who are writing in the tudor period for example i mean everything was documented once you get to the like 15th 16th 17th century and people, of course, then will start to nitpick if you get things wrong. Um, so I feel I'm not going to have such um, maybe like laser focus on on you know maybe deviations from history that I have made. No, that's awesome. I, you're braver than I think the two of us because you know Ronnie and I are just like eh, you know, we'll make it up. No one can tell me there wasn't a, you know a person of this character at this time. You know. Um, because I, yeah, I, I really admire, you know, the ability to do that. But um, I guess then um, one of the things I think that's probably that both of you have in common, right? Because Ronnie, you're at least cribbing from like the general, the general setting, right? And the period, right? If you had to pick a year, like what sort of like time period for, you know, South Central, because it's not just India, right? We're talking like sort yeah. of like, like the Timurid sort of empire and space through there, right? So... Um, a lot of the cultural stuff I took was from the ancient Mauryan Empire of India, okay. and I dialed it up a little bit technologically because when you get to the fact you have a magic system in here, which can sort of influence technology, um, it's obviously going to change the development of things. And you're going to have an allowance for stuff that will change uh, empire, communication, filtration systems, water systems, because they had aqueducts and stuff in ancient India. Uh, they had things like they were doing a census before a lot of the other parts of the world. But a lot of the region I'm taking from is closer to when Kublai Khan had a majority of ownership over the Silk Road. Um, I just am doing, obviously, my own version of it. And I don't think I have British people at all in my world. Uh, the closest analog I have is something that's an amalgamation of Spain and Italy. So Portugal, if you will, because both of the, uh, at least Spain and Italy, were traversing the Silk Road by the time period I'm using. And the Silk Road ended in old Venezia, uh, Venice. So I'm, I'm mostly keeping it around to then. The pre-invention of gunpowder, but black powder exists. No one's just figured out how to put it into a rifle yet, um, which I could do by the end of the series if I wanted, but that's going to change a lot of combat and scaling I want. I'm not sure if I want to really play with that and have cannons and guns. Yeah, well, that was one of the questions, right, is when you, because you've got a little bit more latitude for how you want to <laughs> do things, right? So like, how do you how do you make those decisions, right? The, the, um, the gunpowder is a good question, right? Like, like what are... 
what are the pros and cons when you make a decision like that? And are there any other decisions that are sort of like that that, that come to mind? Um, well, for me, it, a lot of it just has to do with also just the cultural precedent sent just because you have the ability to do something doesn't mean you know you, what you can do with it, especially in a world where magic exists. There's going to be other applications for gunpowder first. And I mean, at the height of the Silk Road, capitalism is still a thing. And while weapons are great, like the invention of fireworks was way more important to people as just a celebratory thing than than killing people. They already had extremely efficient ways of killing people. And the first firearms, which were um, they, they obviously weren't guns. I'm just trying to think what they were called. The China right, like they hand were, cannons, right? Yeah, they were like little hand cannons, like fire yeah. lances or fire spears. They were just like a giant. It looked like a tiny Roman candle with a bo box beneath it, the powder charge, and you had this giant rod behind it, and they were super inaccurate. And I'm like, that's great, but at the time when the Mongols were the best mounted archery guys, like cool you can shoot like one round out of that and miss somebody by like 30 feet and you're a pin cushion because these guys are on horseback with just arrows that could light you up um and then because the magic system that have, it exists in my world leaves people who master it extremely powerful there's a deterrent of that i mean you're not going to go up against an army of angry wizards with guns when they have magic like it just doesn't make sense you're just gonna you go like you know what we can do other things with black powder that are really cool and let's just make money and uh make our empire richer than yours so there's more trade incentive right now to work with black powder. It's also extremely cost prohibitive at the time I'm using it because it's still very new. Right. Uh, it's the usage for anything is just, it's ridiculous. It's like value close to gold. Cause even today, um, this is a great re uh, argument. It's like the price of saffron per ounce, I think is like in the thousands. It's one of the hardest crops to cultivate and saffron is still one of the most expensive things in the world. And by weight, it's close to the value of gold just cause it, it's such a powerful spice still to this day. Um, I think a pinch can color like an entire dish yellow. So it's just using culinary stuff. Plus, it's like how rare it is and hard to get makes it extremely valuable. Yeah, it's used in dyes too. Yeah, because yeah, you can only yeah. get about three or four little stamens per flower. So like the, the mm -hmm. square. Yeah, sure. Um, I used to actually grow it as far north as like England, because of course it used to be warmer in the Middle Ages, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, which is which is kind of crazy to think about sometimes. Um, but I guess um, sort of another question uh, that that's kind of related to this is is getting into the head of the, the time period, right? Whether or not you're, whether you're adapting a time period, uh, you know, to a secondary world or actually working it. We have this sort of conception in the day and age, at least it seems to me that like people are just the same, like they were the same a thousand years ago as they are now. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like that's true. I don't know if you guys maybe disagree with that, um, but um, well, well, do you, do you feel the same way on that subject? Maybe before we can go any farther, do you think that people were radically different in certain ways a thousand years ago, or do you think it's still the underlying basic humanity? Um, I don't know. I think it's a bit of both. It, de it, it depends. Um, you know, in Ireland, uh, there is a, a legal system called the Brehan laws. So you can go back and they're extremely detailed. Um, you can go back and see what the kind of, what crimes were and what the punishments were. And as you read that, I think I see that life is quite similar. You know, the, the, the same things are important. Um, the, the same crimes are held in contempt. And so I think in terms of, I don't know, people just want to get by and have their families and not be troubled too much. Um, but then of course, society was maybe smaller it, it depends where in the country you're from and I would probably say you know opportunities were not so great but you know I, I think all you can do as a writer is find your characters who are in the story and think about what is important to them and the two I've got two female um, POV characters and I quite strongly relate to both of them in some ways, even though they're completely different. So I sort of find that people on the whole are similar. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to sort of like, you know, say, you know, like this is how I feel. Uh, and then and then just, yeah, I, I feel like it came off a little bit strong because yeah. because I, I, one of the stories I like to tell is about the, the graffiti from Pompeii. Right and how it's like literally, oh, it's, like, I know you're gonna go with it's literally the same as bathroom graffiti that you find anywhere, right? So like, there's totally like the same underlying software is the same. But one of the things that that struck me, well, my favorite TV show of all time is um, John Milius's Rome on HBO, and oh, yeah. one of the things that that does so well is capture the really radically different cultural mores of you know uh, first century Rome, right? Which just 
totally alien, right? And so it's it's weird, right, to find you know the the same basic hardware running these different softwares. If, if to, to do a very crude analogy, and I was just wondering if you know there were elements in sort of writing um, you know these stories where you had to account for well, because of course I mean I assume there are right. Uh, the, the sort of radical cultural differences, and was there anything like that that was really challenging, either in creating, you know, you know, you know, fake world Ronnie, or, um, you know, uh, in working with with historical Ireland, right? You said, Shawnee, you said you had a lot of latitude in terms of like time and place and setting, because a lot of the um, a lot of the records aren't very thorough, but you know, surely like we there's enough there to get a sense of of you know culture and stuff like that. So, yeah, was there was there a particular challenge in doing that? Well, I suppose, yes, Ireland now is kind of fairly easygoing liberal. Um, but yes, you go back to the 10th century. It is a tribal country. There are about 200 kings um, at that time. There's no such thing as an Earl. Everyone's just a king and everyone wants to be the king of the province and then a high king. So Ireland is actually quite violent. <laughs> in the, the time period I'm writing about. Um, so yeah, I, I think then, you, you know, you're writing characters who are kings, queens, princes, and you're wanting them to be real people and sympathetic people, but then also be, but this is normal, that kind of, it's like it says tribal society, war is quite common and keeping your place in society is, is key for these people. And how do you do that? Because I would I would 100% say that some of the characters I have written as being sympathetic characters, if they were to be alive today, right now, they would be horrible and you wouldn't want to speak to them because the way they live their lives are at completely at odds with with modern society. So that that I suppose is a challenge. It's yeah. trying to trying to convey this tribal society that's violent and in a lot of upheaval. And still find that people are nice and caring and not all like bloodthirsty individuals so that that was probably my challenge yeah uh ronnie what about you uh well also i want to kind of go back to what you're saying earlier yeah. about like how people change and everything part of me was wanting to make a comment about the rome graffiti thing because isn't that the one where they found two instances of where one guy pretty much alluded to having slept with another man's mother oh That's sure like yeah, and then there's another one where some guy was lamenting that women didn't find him attractive, so now he's just going to go be with guys. And yes, he yeah, was that, telling women that like it's your loss. Yeah, um, yeah, bad choice, ladies. Yeah, no, yeah, it, and it's, yeah. it's that, and you get the usual like for a good time, you know, go to Third Street and ask for Flavia, right? The yeah, 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 like you know, uh, you know, silly nonsense you find scrawled in in you know, uh, bar room, uh, bar bathrooms, yeah. right? Uh, and so there is like this weird continuity of like human behavior, even when you have like radically, you know, sort of different, uh, you have radical differences, right? right. I, I watched, I watched the North man recently. Right. And like, holy cow, am I glad that I do not live in, you know, uh, eighth century, you know, uh, Scandinavia, right? Like, oh my goodness. Uh, what an awful time to be alive. Um, for exactly the reasons that you're outlining, right, Shauna, like that was, uh, really and, and that movie also like really got a lot of the little tiny details correct you know the vikings didn't have horns on their helmets except in like one ceremonial function right just which is great for me because i'm really 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 uh a pain about that sort of thing if i see leather armor in any roman uh, thing i'm done right i just turn it off um but um but it is it's it's those differences right because i have uh like a pretty ongoing back and forth with my editor because my characters will do things that like someone in 2022 just like would not do right uh either because they you know they just would never occur to them to act this mm -hmm. way or you know they might lose their job or something right but like you know fiction is supposed to explore different times different places and even ones that don't exist right and so uh that is that i find that very challenging too right because of course in in my case, and Ronnie, it's something I think you and me maybe have a little bit more in common given the nature of these stories. You have to like make those choices. And often, you know, uh, people are like, why would you make that choice? You could imagine any future you wanted, Christopher, and you picked this one. What's wrong with you? Right. Yeah. Uh, in the past, at least, you've got a little bit more latitude because everyone kind of knows it was it was nasty, brutish, and short in certain ways. Although that's also reductionist, right? Because there's you know, obviously, you know, a lot of great beauty and, and like mm -hmm. to imagine that people never cared about each other in the past is this one amazing thing that I see people think, right? They're just like, yeah. oh yeah, in the past, like nobody, 
like every you know marriage was a nightmare and and no one ever really cared about one another right because you know um i don't know it was the middle ages right right and um anyway so um so i find i find that that's particularly uh particularly challenging for me too is sort of making those cultural uh cultural differences um uh sort of sort of manifest um i think uh, for a lot of things that the individual in many ways maybe hasn't changed but obviously the culture has so societies have changed with what's acceptable um because you're talking about rome and greece and we know attitudes on sexuality and and relationship natures have changed a lot of times a lot more things are permissible then and then society today maybe has you know more restrictive i guess depending on things like how you feel about that and over there it was just completely normal i think the only thing i ever read was once in like male male relationships the only thing that was ever looked down on is who's catching um like if you were the if you were the pitcher it was like cool okay whatever um so they had a really really interesting dynamic with that like even within relationships it's like it's all cool as long as you're the guy on top um and and today there's a lot more of a hard line it seems at times of like this is completely unacceptable or it's not or it is um but again this this is just like you know society changes individuals again going back to the bathroom graffiti of what behavior is if you want to really core it down to, i mean that's a base example but still like i think people haven't changed as us it's just our society and what it tells us to do goes through all these roller coasters of what's acceptable what's not and then maybe it levels off for a while and that's just at the end of the day what it is but that might be why so much fantasy is still relatable why you have something as um grimdark as game of thrones and you take away the historical angle of yes it was all bad like that but those people's individual reactions during such a very grimdark hard time is all completely believable on the individual level and then you go like oh well the society enforces this it is extremely bloodthirsty and cutthroat because there's no laws stopping kings from killing each other to, to gain land and power because it's seen as if you're strong enough to do that you can and then that reinforces the individual behavior of that yeah no totally i i'd like to pivot if i could to talk a little bit about like about, about magic right and about mm -hmm. supernatural and mythology because obviously right like it's that that builds a culture really at its foundations is it sort of metaphysic right mm -hmm. and um and that's one thing that i think all three of us have in common despite the the books being you know very divergent in the kind of fantasy or science fiction in my case that they are right but we're all sort of building from the sort of mores of a certain time and place right how um uh, i guess mostly this might be a shauna first question like how much uh, how did you decide, you know, where to draw the line with how much of the sort of supernatural you're bringing? Because like the Formorians play a role right in the book, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how did you decide where to draw that line? Because like when you're doing the fantasy element, right, you can kind of keep it like really, really restrained, right? Maybe there's like one, you know, miracle or is Merlin actually a wizard or is he a con man, right? But you could also go all in. Um, how did you make that decision? So, um... The Fomorians in my book, and then there's the descendants of the two to Danon. And so I'm all in with what their abilities are. They're based on the mythologies that we have. So the Fomorians have fire magic. And then the two to Danon, um, they have a variety of different magical abilities, but they only have one ability. So there are healers, there are um, warriors, there are druids, witches, cupbearers, harpists. So there's all like different like magic magical powers that they have um but of course then the, the problem is then if you have all these people with magical powers um why isn't everything just easy for them so um in my story i have said it that the magic in ireland is starting to fade and these two tribes have been at war with each other for a long time as is in the mythologies and the fomorians who are left have only survived because the two to Danon think they're all dead. And so they're hiding their magical powers and they can't use it for fear of detection. So in my first book, I would say them, even though people have their magical powers, it's not a con, you know, or, you know, do they, don't they have these magical powers? They do, but it's quite restrained in book one because I'm trying to so set the, the players in the scene and the historical setting. Um, but as the series progresses, uh, people, uh, I suppose, will start to use their magic a little bit more and the, the old feuds start to show a bit more. Awesome. Ronnie, what about you? 
Uh, I'm doing something really similar, and I took inspiration from this from Game of Thrones, uh, especially the visual adaptation, because something I saw that resonated with a lot of people was that it was extremely accessible because of its lack of overwhelming magic. Um, this ties into something I've personally been feeling as a fantasy reader of late, and this is not a criticism, but there's definitely been this zeitgeist of like hard magic. And when you talk about what's your book about, people first go, like, what's your magic system? Like that's become the predominating thing. And I'm like, that doesn't define the story. And in fact, your magic system should be a product of your world. Your world shouldn't be a product of your magic system. You know, magic, if you look at history and, and all the context of fables and mythology, magic grows with and out of the world. It doesn't exist really before, unless you want to talk about creation myths of entities creating it. But magic that is accessible to the common person or lesser deities is something that usually is worked to. Uh, you have druidry, you have, you know, seers, um, wizards, magi, which are like the predecessors to magicians uh, out of the Middle East. And it was something that had to be created and built and worked at. And I liked how Game of Thrones made it numinous, apart from the, the opening with the White Walkers, which promised the audience that there's something ethereal and supernatural. Magic was in the background until the very end of the first season. And then you saw the dragons actually hatch. And it was just that one window of there's a sense of wonder here. And because it kept it in reserve, I think every time you got to see it, it added more of that, like, oh, my God, there's magic here. And it's, it's infinitely cooler than if you have a hard magic system to me right now where you use it all the time. And you're, you know, like wind shaping something to shoot out your storm blade that like, you know, casts fire. And it's like it's like watching an anime, which I do enjoy, but there's almost too much of it. So when something magically cool happens on a lot of novels to me, it doesn't feel cool. It lost right. like what I what I hold is a sense of wonder. And for me, uh, my magic takes root in a lot of like philosophical beliefs out of Asia and like the whole idea of training the mind, the body, and the spirit together to hold certain beliefs. And you have to keep culturing yourself to do that. And there's mental exercises, and it's not something you can just do immediately. It involves a practice very similar to meditation. Uh, that makes magic already extremely inaccessible. So when you do do it it feels infinitely more magical and there's a reward for it. And that's part of the the catharsis I want to work into my novels. I, I want magic to show up very rarely. And when it does, even the audience is very not only wowed by how cool it is, but they feel like it is magic. Like there is that sense that you can't really put a word to besides just calling it magic, but it has that moment that you just feel. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I've done sort of the same thing because uh, there wasn't really anything that evidently I'll use the word supernatural advisedly because this is, I'm, I wrote science fiction, right? And so is it supernatural or is it, you know, we've got the Clark's third law issue, right? Mm -hmm. And I refuse to answer this question. Uh, any of my readers asking in the chat, uh, you know, is it supernatural? I don't know. Uh, you tell me. Um, but I do feel right, especially because I'm writing in the future, <laughs> right? That like keeping those elements restrained makes them more impactful. Mm -hmm. But there are, you know, there are settings, right, where, you know, you want to have your elves running around, right? And you want things to be a little bit more alien. But I, I think you're right. I think in the case of Game of Thrones, that was what part of the reason for its sort of widespread critical success is it got a lot of normies who, like, like it says, what's an elf? I'm not, like, my dad would, like, has an elf in it? What's, I don't know what that is, right? Uh, you know, and I, and so I think that, I think that's interesting because I think it's, it's helped to grab a lot of people. Mm -hmm. who might have been a little bit more hesitant to, you know, look at this, you know, nerd, nerd crap, right? Um, and it's sort of, sort of throwing the wedge open. But um, we have some questions, I think, in the chat. So maybe we can, we can pivot sure. to that part of the show here. Let me see what I can find. Uh, and folks, if I miss any questions, please let me know, because I'm famously bad at catching every single one. Um, let's see, we've got a bunch of people saying that they're reading your book right now, uh, Ronnie. Uh, of course, Sean is going to be just a, just a minute. But uh, Stillian asks, uh, and maybe this is a Ronnie question, uh, what about the travels of Ibn Battuta? Did you look at those at all? Oh, absolutely. So uh, his our catalog in Penguin has a great classic of it called the Ibn Fadlan. And Ibn Battuta is known as like the Marco Polo from Islam, actually before Marco Polo. Yeah. Uh, and he, he's actually journeyed across the world. Uh, it met with the Vikings and became, I don't want to say like welcomed. I mean, no, I guess welcome was the right word. Like over time, he earned their trust and he's brought in. And it's something that cultured the idea with me, like how stories and reputations travel. Um, there's mundane examples throughout the history of the Silk Road of how you'd have traders from the Middle East like once or twice or once a year or once every two years, because it's a long journey, go as far as up to like Britain, all the way to the Vikings. And you don't just trade your goods, obviously, and make reputations. You trade stories because it's what else do you have to talk about? But it's where the idea of like, where do those goofy paintings of giraffes come from on the other side of the world where they don't have giraffes? A lot of it is a trader from a country that has one talking to somebody and going like, oh, yeah, these are the animals we have at home. And there's this giraffe. And someone's like, 
what is that? He's like, it's like this giant horse that you have, but it's like black and yellow. And it's got this ridiculously long neck. And they're like, this is the goofiest sounding thing I've ever heard of. I've never seen one of these, but someone tries to paint it and you have a giraffe that looks nothing like a giraffe and it's in a museum. So I, I took the ideas of his journeys and how trade might happen, um, how foreigners can be treated. And it's a lot more welcoming than you would imagine, because there's this idea that the old world, especially along well-traveled trade and economic routes are extremely xenophobic. And that's not true. Um, there's definitely ignorance in how people might perceive lesser known aspects of other cultures, but most people still just wanted to make a buck and they were very open and honest, like, okay, you're here to trade. Like we all, we like money. Um, let's see what we can do and then have fun with food and culture. And also how, how stories change and get twisted because it's how so many ridiculous animals that don't exist ended up with the reputations they do like the Carcadon, uh, which is probably still just a giant rhinoceros that somebody saw and turned it into a mythological creature. Um, that's the theory, but I mean, it looks like a, a rhinoceros it is painted like a rhinoceros just a really big evil mean one it's probably a rhino that someone yeah, just yeah. ran away with i think my favorite silk road story and you probably know this one is the uh the parthians used to take silk from china and sell it to the romans and the romans would take it apart and they would repattern it because the romans you know would reweave it and they didn't like the style from china and so the parthians kept the price of silk low between the, the Chinese and the Romans for ages by convincing the Chinese the Romans were growing it too. This was before Justinian had them steal the worms. And it, it was literally like a centuries long unplanned decentralized con because just all of these Parthian traders were like, yeah, Roman silk. Um, and it just like no, there, at no point did a Parthian emperor say, this is what we're going to do. It was just- It like, just happened. It's just businessmen who did it themselves, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just for, for hundreds of years. It's just hilarious. Um, and, and thinking about uh, in Batuta made me think of that, although he's much later than this. The Parthians, you know, collapsed in what, the like 200s or something? 200s, um, yeah. But uh, uh, let's see. Uh, we kind of touched on this a little bit. But Chris here asks, uh, or, or says rather, you know, the success of historical fantasy is rooted in an exploration of themes and plotting. Uh, being period accurate isn't enough for him, at least. Shauna, do you feel the same way? Uh, you know, do you feel like the, you know, the story, like if you need to change some historical facts to make things work uh, to, for the story, is that something, is that a line you're willing to cross, I guess? Um, well, for, for my story, I, I didn't actually change very much. Um, I changed names because there was quite a few characters who had the same name and we're already dealing with Irish names which are hard um, for people to read so I didn't want to make it even harder by having like three characters with the same name uh, and I, I squashed the timeline a little bit just so it, the the time jump like there's a it's over I think about an eight year period my story but you know that to me was enough mm. um, but I do think yes when you're doing historical fantasy and you have decided to set it in a real place you should try to, to to keep it as accurate as possible otherwise there's no point setting it there you know you may as well just set it somewhere else and do what you want and the reason you know I suppose well I've said it in in Ireland it's to explore the conflict that went on at the time and I think if you start changing a lot you possibly unravel um, the authenticity of the story you're trying to tell. But in saying that it, it is historical fantasy, it's it's not um, it's not a textbook. You know, I wouldn't say to someone to read my story before an exam, you know, read, read a, a non-fiction book. Um, and, you know, you have to have some sort of artistic license as an author, because even if you have all the dates and all the timelines and all the people, you don't know how people were feeling or really why people made the decisions that they did. You're, you're guessing and that's where the fun is. Awesome. I know that was a risky <laughs> question, you know, you're writing historical fantasy. Do you feel like you can change the past? Uh, uh, you know, so I was, I was setting you up there a little bit for which I apologize. But uh, <laughs> speaking of nonfiction books though, uh, you know, uh, I say this advisedly, uh, Ronnie, uh, Core here asks, uh, you said your culture is inspired in part by the Mauryan uh, Empire. Did you ever draw on the Artha Shastra by uh, Kotilia? Um, was that one of your sources? Yes. Mauryan is a big uh, Indian, Indian history and weeb, uh, uh, and myth weeb. So. <laughs> Well, uh, I did use the weeb, which is a term for like Japanese animators. Oh, I know. Yeah, they, they, I know, right? They're, uh, they're weebs and weebs, Ronnie. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, but absolutely. Uh, you won't see it played out too much in the first book because I haven't gone into the political spectrum of my world. It's referenced in the background because in the first book, and this is not a spoiler, uh, the caste system I devised, Ari, is of the lowest of the low. So he has very little chance to affiliate with anyone of like a nobler, better blood and see the inner workings of society on a political level. I mean, he's one step removed from being a street homeless kid, which at some point he actually does become. And that's not a major spoiler. Uh, but it is in the background and it's going to be fleshed out more. And th that particular work talks about it's all um, treatises on stagecraft, uh, political science, economic policy, military strategy, like history of a political system for a long time and just how it's evolved. Um, I'm trying to think what else it talks because I, I, I did this before I actually conceptualized the world. I think it went into taxes, like holdings. It, it was it's brilliant stuff, but it all is in the background right now in my world. That I dialed it up for how trade works because you actually will see more trade and economic stuff of coinage systems, conversion, currency rates um, that Ari has to deal with because money is an immediate factor in his life. But he isn't fully aware of the trade implications yet. And that sort of starts happening once he goes to school. Um, people start talking about it. You realize that there's a banking system in this world. They don't have centralized currency yet, but they have regulated exchange that governments do at least because they need to. Otherwise, what's anyone's money's worth and how do you what do you back it against? Um so I, I use it mostly for that. And as the series progresses, hopefully if I get to take it to as long as I want to, more and more of the political stage play will actually come in between at least uh, the Indian analog countries. I do have a lot of political stagecraft going on for Itania, which is, um, like I said, closer to Portugal or Italy or Spain. Uh, that will be heavily featured in book one and two. Awesome. So I guess a question that kind of branches off of this, though, is in talking about primary sources, right? What did you each uh, sort of uh, draw from? Start with, um, Shauna, maybe you first. Uh, uh, so the sources that I use. So yeah. um, for the specific period that uh, I researched, um, there isn't there isn't a lot that was written at the time. But because the Vikings were in Ireland at the time, there are um, some bards uh, who who were there, and they actually recorded um, most of the well, Gormla. But anyway, she's recorded in these stories. Um, so I, I read those documents, and then Brian Brew's family, about a hundred years, maybe two hundred years after he died, they had a poet like write a whole story about um, his life. So they're the two primary source documents, and that is really it. Apart from you have the monks of the period record marriages, battles, and um, births. You know that they're recording events. They're not really recording anything more than that. So for a lot of the research, you know, I'm really reading thick, like textbooks that have historians have put together, and they like accumulated as much. Um, evidence and documentation as they can. Uh, so I was reading all of, all of those books and just what is available on the, the university websites. Um, so they have translated some of the old Irish documents um, from the monasteries at the time. Uh, but there, 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 isn't, there isn't a huge amount in terms of, of documentation to read outside outside what I've I've said no. it's, it's so so far back and aside from the monks who recorded what was going on there wasn't really um a huge amount of those literature at the time um outside of what what we have discovered and then of course Ireland has had a troubled history um you know it was invaded in 1169 so I would also assume that a lot of the literature that was recorded has been destroyed you know sure. Yeah. I think in the, the the that's why the monasteries are the main source of information because they were I suppose their buildings were more protected and the, the documentation and the books like the Book of Kells, um, is the Book of Leinster. There's like some key documents that have survived, and it's probably why that they they are based in the monasteries because um, it's a country that's been at war really for a thousand years. Yeah. Like even even to like find out your own family history. Um, a lot of the documents were kept in Dublin during, like, uh, you know, the, the Irish Revolution of, like, 1916 to 1921. So even trying to find who you're related to prior to the 19th century is really difficult because all the records were destroyed. Wow. No, I didn't realize it was that. Uh, wow. Um, I didn't know that it was it was that severe. I assumed that, like, baptismal registries were still kept by the churches and stuff. 
that's where you can get some documentation from. So if you want to trace your family um, back, but a, a huge, a huge amount of records have been have been lost. Um, wow. Spent, like even like war records and um so I know on my mother's side um there's some uncles who uh were in an Ellis Enniskillen regiment um and you, we, we can't find anything like about them all the records are gone wow wow and that's that's the first world war sorry that's the the time period I'm talking about and the the documents are, don't exist anymore yeah. so yeah so you know that was I suppose that was a challenge because you're trying to pull together um an historically accurate picture um there aren't a lot of source documents and some of the historians who have gone through the history have done so with the lens of someone from the 19th century 20th century so um very catholic um very male <laughs> um lens that you're seeing you know especially with the christianity it's through that lens so actually when you go back and you read the histories yourself um i was always taught that this period of conflict in ireland was sort of the christian kings of ireland versus the pagan vikings and that isn't the case at all because the vikings have converted by this stage and ireland is actually in trouble with rome at this stage for being so poorly um converted uh, and so then once you start exploring it and reading it yourself, you're like, oh, this is very, very different to what I was taught. And actually, it's fine to have a new lens on these old stories and on the same records and think about it from a, a from a, maybe like just a different perspective, which is what I have done. Yeah, that's one of my favorite historical misconceptions is that everyone like doesn't realize most of the Vikings were already Christian. There were a lot of them were Aryans, right? I, not why. But, uh, you know, uh, but yeah, that one always gets me. It's that, that damn History Channel show, right? It's just, doesn't, it's just not right. Um, but uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, historical sources, Ronnie, uh, you know, I know that you've read a lot of stuff on building your world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the most helpful ones for me was uh, Silk Roads, plural, A New History of the World by Peter Frankopan, who his is more religious based, but is massive on the religions that were evolving at the time, conversion. Uh, issues between Christianity and Islam, especially that were happening at that point. Um, religions in India starting to spread, obviously Mongol uh, traditions, because the Mongols at this point were going, at least in his book, were moving away from just having Tengrianism, which was their predominant religion of like um, the eternal blue sky it was monotheistic, uh, but the sky was also personified as a giant wolf. Um, it was also heaven. It was more than one thing. And obviously the early cons adopted the policy of allowing other cultures to keep their culture and religion within the Mongol empire while they were taking over things to the point where uh, Kublai, uh, the second most famous Mongol after Genghis, uh, his mother was actually a Christian very famously, which is why he had ties and allowed for a lot of easy, easier trade with, um, I believe Venice at the time. He wasn't a great fan of the Pope because he was absolutely a uh, most power dominant hungry person ever. But uh, that novel, uh, that book definitely informed me the most. Obviously the Ibn Fadlan, as we referenced earlier, um, the prose Edda, uh, the Norse epics, Beowulf, the Iliad and the Odyssey, because like I was saying earlier, part of this is this is a storytelling story about stories and specifically epics. So I studied most of the earliest epics because there's a great YouTuber named Crecken Ford, who is another source I use. Uh, he's specifically one of the best scholars of proto-Indo-European culture and history. And he's shown and there's a lot of theories and proof behind the fact that a lot of these early cultures traded and inspired each other because they're analogs of similar things that happened in the Odyssey and the Iliad to the Mahabharata and Raman and Rig Veda, which predate that, not by too much. So we don't know if they both inspired each other while they were, because there, there's this gap of like, when's the earliest records of both and it's blurry. Um, we don't know if they actually just inspired each other. Like were there people telling myths and stories that led to the creation of both the Odyssey and the Iliad and Mahabharata and Rig Veda around the same time? Right, or they're both drawn from some common source. Right? Or com an older Proto-Indo-European source. And we haven't found out what that is, but it's very similar. Um, so in, I believe it's the Rig Veda, where Indra kills Vitra, which is like the first dragon ever recorded. Uh, and the one before that is Tiamat. But in, in the epics written that we mostly source from, it's Vitra, and he's literally known as the first dragon, also the obstacle. Um, Indra is a storm god who kills him with a proto-hammer, a club, and the club is said to have hold all the power of a thunderbolt. And Vitra holds all the waters of the world and is responsible for a flood myth, and it's very similar to how Thor kills Jormungandr. 
Um, he kills him with, you know, Mjolnir, which is like a hammer that has all the power of thunder in it. And, you know, he fights him on this giant world, giant battlefield of um, all the oceans. The oceans are roiling. It's the end of the world because of um, Ragnarok. And he ends up killing him, obviously, at the cost of his own life. But this giant battle between two gods who wield thunder against a giant serpent has been played out a lot. Um, there's a thing, of, I can't remember which Indian epic it is on top of my head, of how a hero has to prove himself by stringing an unstringable bow and making a perfect shot which is very similar to what happens to Odysseus when he gets home. He has to string a bow, only he can string and make that perfect shot. Uh, so I wanted to take this because I found this theory of how the best beats of all the greatest epics have been retold, and a lot of modern ones do this. Uh, Joseph Campbell obviously codified this into the hero's journey. Sure, sure, sure. It's accurate for a lot of them but because he's taking from the most popular ones, but a lot of pre present-day authors have done this too. There's a lot of novels where the end of the novel is someone fighting uh, a dragon or a dragon-like being, and it mostly seems to come from the fact that a dragon was the greatest obstacle in old epics. Uh, in fact, Vitro's other name is The Obstacle. He was like the original obstacle. That's why you have a dragon at the end of your story. It's the hardest thing to kill and beat. Same with Tiamat. And uh, Name of the Wind does this where it subverts it. Um, you know, Quoth kills a Dracus at the end of it. And it's supposed to be his dragon. But a lot of the beats in that novel are famous beats from existing epics all throughout time. Like you, you could go back and chronicle everything. Uh, like he says, you know, you get the mentor character, you lose your family, which puts the hero on his his journey um, out of his comfort zone, his self-development phase, meeting other mentors, going out there, um, having his dark night of the soul when everything seems like it's lost, and then, in this case, fighting a dragon. And I wanted to play with those in my, in my story, following very famous epic beats um, that have been done all throughout time, and also finding out how to subvert them. So there was just as much mythology storytelling research as there was historical accuracy one. Awesome. Yeah, I, um, uh, what was I going to say? I lost it. Um, no matter. Uh, it'll come to me. Uh, moving on, I have an easy question, uh, which is hardcover. Um, <laughs> uh, yes? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so actually, this is, this is a really good question. Uh, and we'll probably mention it again at the end. But um, how can people get the books in question? Uh, you know? Um, uh, for me, they're available on all retailers. Um, Tor US has done it throughout North America. It's available currently in ebook, audiobook, um, hardcover from any retailer I'm assuming you can imagine. And then there's always Amazon. And then the UK is exact similar deal. I don't know if I have a paperback in the UK because I've been seeing weird comments. People just go paperback similar to that, like question mark. I'm like, I don't know. I wasn't told because I think the UK does two formats of paperback. They have like a, uh, yeah, there's a bigger one. Yeah. a trade one and then they do the, the mass market b size i think they call it I, i'm not sure i was never told if i have a paperback i should probably check but i do know i'm available in all the same formats over there um same retailers um amazon whatever bookstore you want to choose and right now we're working on a few other foreign countries those haven't been solidified yet sadly but gotcha shauna what about you because uh, the book's not quite out yet right no it's out on the first of september but i have a staggered release um, so it's the 1st of September um, for ebook everywhere, but for the hardcover, it's the 1st of September for the UK, Ireland and Commonwealth territories. And then it's the 1st of November for Canada and America. Oh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's been a, a staggered release. Um, it wasn't meant to be originally, but then they, they changed um, tack. So, yeah, there's but, a lot of weirdness going on these days. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, there's been like paper shortages and... Um, I'm sorry, by the way. I must have contributed to that because the size of my book. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, Ronnie, they, they didn't let you... They didn't make you split your book. The last, no. It must be why I had to split mine. It's all your fault. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like gigantic. People think that my book will kill them, but... Uh, no, geez. book two is going to be worse. I turned in the draft at like 450,000 words. It's a sickness, but, Ronnie. It's a sickness. But it is too. smaller than any of Brandon's recent work. So my argument is clearly that Tor has the printing capability to print something that big. I mean, I know it's going to be cut a little bit in editing, but we'll see how much. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a typesetter, and, and she said there are, I, I think, 39 to 41 lines. I can't remember the number on on the big words radiance book and there's no running head which i i've not read it so i didn't realize they literally like crammed extra lines and like deleted the like running heads in order to make that book fit which is just completely <laughs> insane it's completely insane uh pick it two books brandon geez um it's just amazing 
But uh, and on the off chance Isaiah was asking hardcover to me, Isaiah, you know that book one's hardcover doesn't exist anymore. It's very sad. Uh, Collector's item. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're just all museum pieces now. Um, Stillian here asks, now that the commercial break is over, uh, Stillian asks, what about uh, prehistory? Uh, exploring the possible fantasy aspects of a prehistoric setting like in Jenny Tartakovsky's Primal. Have uh, Ronnie, have you thought? I know you have like a billion ideas. Shauna, I'm sure you must have some other story ideas as well, but have you thought about doing something that's like really, really, really old? Um, or I don't know. Um... I suppose this is as far back as I could go um, where I felt comfortable with the historical setting and uh, and the history and that there was enough actually, even though I'm saying there wasn't a lot of um, documentation to read, there was enough. Um, you go any further back and it's it's just the myths that we have, the, the, the myth, like mythological cycle, the uh, Fenian cycle and the Ulster cycle. Um, so they're really old. They're um, maybe, I don't know, some of them like four, five thousand years ago. Um, so that would be interesting to explore. Uh, I don't think people know so much about um, those cycles of mythology. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm new, new to, to the writing uh, game as in I've been writing for a long time, but this is my first book that has been published. So. Now that I have a bit of time to write, um, you know, I would love to go further back in, in time in Ireland and, and explore what, what else there is to, to look at, because I don't think there's much much there already. Yeah. Do you think that, like, all of your work will in some way be tied to Ireland? Like, I have a broad sense that most of what I'm going to write, if not all of it, will be connected to this future history I'm building. Do you think that Ireland is going to be sort of the constant thread that weaves through all your work? Or it is early to say that. So I know that's a big question. But uh... um, well, I have this trilogy deal and there is another trilogy that I'm wanting to pitch that is in the same world. Um, but I also uh, have another story idea, which is which is epic fantasy. And it's just completely different. Um, so ideally, I think I would like to do a bit of everything. You awesome. know, um, I know a lot of, like, obviously, I know a lot of Irish history, mythology, and so there's plenty of ideas in that in that area. But I think to maybe always write the same thing, just for for myself personally, would be um, maybe become a bit boring or unchallenging. Um, so, yes, I do have other fantasy ideas. I, I don't have other historical fiction ideas, if you know what I mean. I think. To learn about another country and culture and history, you know, it's, it's not that you can't do it if you're if you're not from that place, but I mean, you have to put in the hours and the research and the, the groundwork. And so I don't know if I would want to do that. I think sure. if I was sticking within the historical fiction side, um, you know, I think I think Ireland is where where my strengths are because you know it, you know, that's thirty five years plus research and you know love of the history and mythologies that i that i have no awesome ronnie what about you on the prehistory question have you thought about going full conan i'm glad you said conan because that's primal but they also had at least fire and some level of bronze age technology uh yes so i can't remember if i did anything in book one with that but i know for certain in book two i have nesting stories about you know creation myths first people's stories um oh, that neat. exist okay. and of course part of that is is it just a story or are these actually true because again i'm doing that soft numinous thing with the stories inside stories is this just a telling of something is this fable actually have precedence that maybe inspired this world since magic exists and that's something people are gonna have to figure out and really read and reread for uh, because I left a lot of clues and secret Easter eggs, but I do tackle that mostly through nesting stories. I don't know if I'm ever going to write anything set in that time period, because I really want to flesh that out with the idea of that it has this numinous nature of being folklore, and you get to still see it, because I write my full nesting stories out. They are a chapter or two chapters of full interactions and characters from that time, but I don't want to set an actual novel there, at least right now. I, I would like to maybe do something like a full Bronze Age story if it was completely removed from this and go like, here's South Asian primal, you know, like Conan or The Witcher, but dialed back further. I think that could be very, very cool. Yeah, I've been tempted by the Bronze Age thing myself, although that's not exactly prehistorical. But I have thought because there's a much debated hypothesis that the origin of a lot of the flood myths 
-hmm. was the collapse of the ice shelf that separated the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, right? Mm -hmm. And, and then all the flooding of the Euphrates and Tigris, which happened. Yeah, a lot. just the seasonal flooding of the rivers too, right? But what's you know, but but that of either way, right? That's going to impact like a lot of those sort of pre, um, uh, like late Neolithic civilizations that were. That's mm -hmm. sort of predated like Sumer and stuff like that, right? Which is a, I, I am deeply fascinated by, you know, uh, by Mesopotamia, right? So like that is something that I would really like to do one day if I decide to leave the, you know, leave the timeline. But um, cause what's cool about that is, and, the, and this is one of the tricky things about prehistory is that when you look at stuff like pre-writing, right? You have to basically start doing anthropology instead of history. And those aren't exactly the same thing. But like, I remember there's a book called uh, Antediluvian by Will McCarthy. It's a science fiction novel, uh, but it's about time traveling to the Neolithic because there's a lot of rethinking about what the late Neolithic was like, right? Because we've got evidence of like long distance trade networks actually the, the, of basically the early Silk Road, right? But before Sumer, right? Like 4,000 BC, mm -hmm. you've got, uh, you know, um, uh, wine from what is now like the Caucasus, right? Georgia and, and Armenia down in lower Iraq and even into Egypt. And what's so neat about that, right? Is that like long distance trade like predates the state, right? Mm -hmm. As like a cultural evolution. Cause there's like, there's not even, they're not even, you know, kingdoms yet. There are like maybe city states, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but they're so small. It's just, you know, people tend to think that like, oh, the market must have come later. No, the market is much older. No, the market's been there before, yeah. Much older than civilization, and it will be there when civilization has gone. Uh, but I uh, I would love to do something with sort of the flood, right, uh, and, uh, and and do something like that in one, one of these days. So that was a really cool question there, Stillian. You bring up uh, a good point with that, though, too, because the history, if you go back to at least fantasy novels, which there was enough research for some of these, how certain – small political powers evolved usually had to do with economic and commerce stuff too like the local mayor of a hobunk village was usually the mayor because he created a tavern or an inn or something that had an epic a, a good economic purpose in the town but also a lot of visitors and trade networks to start developing out of there and he just happened to be the wealthiest person with a point of like concentration in the village for things to spread up around so even if you don't have a larger government than that you have usually one focal point and it, it would make sense to be a trader or some kind of innkeeper or something that established like a point of community and had tradable resources and enough wealth to redistribute within your community through trade based on localized goods. And there's something dramatically attractive about that sort of scale too, right? Mm -hmm. Because the cast of key players is small enough to actually yeah. be the cast of key players in a novel, yeah. which is one of the reasons I think that like we're so grab uh, so drawn to like you know monarchic stories right mm -hmm. when it's you know when it's a family people understand that a lot better than like the junior subcommittee on mm -hmm. you know the issue of waste management like that's not mm -hmm. a novel right and maybe government but that's like it's not mm -hmm. enough that's not romantic enough i think mm -hmm. to be a novel uh at least at least to me but um grayskull asks shauna uh is the title of your book uh a reference to a specific myth or text yes um it is uh relates to a specific text so Lady Gregory um, was a woman who lived in Ireland uh, over a hundred years ago. And so she was, she lived in Dublin. She was like landed gentry and she decided to collect all the myths of Ireland together um, because at that stage, I suppose that there, you know, we have loads of myths, but they're not collected in, in the, like books at that stage, they were just verbal and, there was different variations of the same myths even throughout Ireland. So she decided that she would try to collect all the stories that she was hearing and she wrote a book called um, Of Gods and Fighting Men. So that is, that's her novel and it was written over a hundred years ago. So the, the first myth or the first stories that she talks about in this book is the mythological cycle, which is when the Tour de Danon uh, came to Ireland. Uh, and the Fomorians came to Ireland and they fought each other and there was also the people of Ireland called the Firbolg um, and it's about how those three groups started to interact and so the gods are the Tuatha de and the Fomorians and the fighting men are the the men and the the descendants of those those people like Cahillan and Finn McCool so yeah, so my story is the children of gods and fighting men. So I'm what comes after. My story comes after all these myths and it's what happened next. Um, so for anyone who is listening that knows anything about Irish mythology, um, there's four cycles of mythology. Um, there's the king cycle, which 
is a bit haphazard and a collection of stories about various kings. But the other three are in chronological order. So you have the mythological cycle, the Ulster cycle, then the Fenian cycle. And so the children of gods and fighting men would be set about four or five hundred years after the Fenian cycle. Awesome. Um, let's see. This is a Ronnie question, but we can kind of generalize it. Uh, Safina asks, how many books in the first binding book series, Ronnie? Uh, so I have sold three to Torrin Golanx, uh, which is maybe the best answer I can give. Because I know there's also a thing of like, if you have a lot of books in a series, many people don't buy and read because they they are like, well, we'll wait for the series to be done, which is actually counterproductive to the series getting done because then people don't buy. But um, I've sold three. Awesome. Uh, and Shawnee, you said yours is a trilogy, right? Yeah, I, I could word for word replicate Ronnie's answer oh. there. <laughs> <laughs> you were smarter than me. I said five originally, and I ran into that problem very frequently, uh, selling books to people at shows. Oh, yeah, it's not done. Oh, sorry, kid, later. Yep. Uh, but I'm almost done now, so I showed all those people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, Chris asks a uh, question for Shauna. How important do you think it is was to help the readers pronounce the names within the books? Um, um, well, I thought it was quite important, but you know, people will read the book and will say the names however they want to. That, that, of course, always happens. But I did put a pronunciation guide at the start of the book. So if you want to, you can say the names correctly. Um, and it's just, I don't know. I mean, I think because I was writing a book and I decided to set it in Ireland and it's an opportunity to tell people a little bit more about the country that it would be quite nice for people to to try to say the names uh, correctly. And Irish is such a difficult language. It's not said phonetically. So um, Gormla is one of my main characters. But if you were to read it, it's Gormflaith, if you were to, to say it phonetically. And so either way is fine. But for those out there who, who want to have a go at saying the names correctly, there is the, the, the pronunciation guide at the start of the book. Well, that is a relief because I I, I struggle with uh, I struggle with Gaelic names, uh, despite my part of the country having a very strong Scotch Irish sort of thread in it here down by the Appalachians. Uh, mind you, they're a couple hours away, but uh, it's close in American terms. So, um, another one for you, Shauna. Um, I watched an anime where the main character's family uh, were called Tuatha Day, and they were doctors that were a secret society of assassins. Uh, is that Irish mythology? Um, um, so the Tuatha Dé Danann are uh, a tribe of magical people from Ireland, and Tuatha Dé Danann means the tribe of the day, um, and Dana was an Irish goddess, so that's kind of what it's referenced to. It's a tribe of people who follow Dana. Um, so they're not doctors, <laughs> and they're not a society of assassins, um, but um, within that group of people, there are healers. So maybe this book has doctors that are have magical powers to heal people. And there are famous warriors and uh, and champions, and they have a variety of magical powers. So I suspect that this is a story where they maybe know a little bit about Irish mythology and have decided to kind of make an urban fantasy story series, which I see a lot, um, you know, when it's wonderful. Yeah, um, the, la wonderful. the Land of the Bay and all this is very popular and you can see that's a lot of that comes from Irish mythology. I want to say too, I we just talked about me mispronouncing Irish names and then I mispronounced uh, Tear de Nen. So uh, <laughs> yes, I wanted to say that I noticed that I'd done that. So good, you know, good job <laughs> me. Uh, Corey, yes, I called you out for being a weeb because you are, uh, but we love you here. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> for the both of you, uh, what is the best way to document the things you want to use in your book? Um, there is so much information. Is it hard to keep track of stuff from your research? Uh, for me, no, because when I whenever I do do research, I handwrite all my notes separately, and then I have a. This is tedious, but it works for me. Especially they've proven with retention, handwriting helps. I rewrite it down. Anything I think is pertinent on index cards, which I actually have to my right here, and I use both sides of the index cards, where one side has like a very quick summary, so I know the key bold idea that I might want to use. And on the back of it, I flip it over with the line side. There's more embellished versions of it. And then there's a program that's free, and I believe it's called Trello. 
It's a web app. You can get um, log into it, and it creates digital um, index cards over like a digital unlimited board. And then you can click and have full typed out versions of the notes if you really want to expand them. So I have this like progressive scaling of how I keep my notes. But one helps me retain it. One keeps it with an eyesight that I can quickly just go through and they go like, oh, I know there's a web app I have that I can open instantly. And then there's longer versions if I want to really detail it. And that ensures I don't lose the core text off the internet. I have dummy notes here. And then I have the notes I take to just help me learn in the first place. Awesome. Um, Trana, how do you, how do you do uh, your research stuff? Um, um, well, I, I'm old school. I have handwritten notebooks because um, yeah, I just, I find it just, it's all in one notebook and it's all in one place. And I didn't get lost because I had a terrible habit before of using multiple books and plus my I computer and then you would be where <laughs> I have that quote somewhere or I have that information and now I, I can't find it so I've tried to be quite strict and it's just one notebook and everything is there so it's like my yeah um and but also I think because it's a period of history and you know mythologies I've been reading for years and years a lot of it is also there um and actually once I finish writing the book, I actually have to spend a period of time kind of going through my notes and uh, kind of textbooks and then almost like cross referencing or checking everything in case that something that I thought was true 20 years ago, you know, and I've just written, assuming it's correct, you know, I, I need to check everything. Yeah. So I do that as well afterwards to make sure that def definitely I've got everything right awesome yeah, and of course i just make everything up because it's you know <laughs> so uh when i do draw from uh historical stuff it's usually like my setting's so removed from our time and place that if i want to reference uh you know shakespeare right i'll pick a basic one right uh it'll just be because I, i'll realize like oh i can bring this in here right because the setting is such a grab bag of like random like bits and bobs that sort of as they come up to me, I'm like, oh, I can work this into the world building here, right? Because a lot of my, at this point, gosh, like a lot of my basic world building was like so long ago that I don't remember, uh, you know, being being five books into the series at this point that like when I actually do get to go reference a specific thing, it'll be because, wait, this reminded me about this random Assyrian thing that I read about. Let's mention Asher Banipal because I can, uh, which is way less sophisticated than, uh, than some other methods. Um, but uh yeah so that's me <laughs> what about for your series do you because obviously there's a lot of internal history yeah that then you know things that you've written in book one has to flow through to book you know two three four five and i know myself because i'm writing book three now that i am already sometimes like i have to go check book one it's not it's not like on tap anymore because it's been a while since i've read it so you're in our five books then? Yeah, yeah. And I have terrible, terrible time jumps. Um, yeah, so I um, I have a couple of timeline documents, and my readers keep demanding that I show them to them, but they're full of spoilers, kids, so I can't. Uh, and um, and so I, I have one for Hadrian's life specifically because he doesn't age. Like, people, you know, they get frozen, right, so they don't age at the right you know rate relative to the calendar. So I have to keep track of ages and the general ordinary progression of years and so I've got one for his life since it's so important, right? And then I have one for the broader universe so that I can keep all of that up. Um, and um, and so, yeah. So uh, Ronnie uh, says he's got to go in the chat. So, Ronnie, thank you for being here. We're going to wrap up. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming, man. Uh, really excited. Everybody go check out the first binding available wherever books are sold. I put a link in the description for my man okay. Ronnie here. Uh, so, man, we'll see you soon. Uh, I'll Great. see you in like a week. So Yeah, Dragon God. Uh, Later, brother. Um, Hi, Ronnie. It was lovely to see the uh, talk to you. All right. And uh, so, Shauna, you want to stick around and do a couple more questions? Yeah, um, that's fine. All right, because we're we're reaching the end of the uh, we're reaching the end here. Uh, but let's see. Uh, where was I? Um, uh, Off-topic question. Uh, do you? Uh, so he's reading, uh, listening to Ronnie's audiobook. Do you ever think about how your books will sound when you uh, when read aloud when uh, when you were writing? I know I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I well, whenever I wrote my story, um, I had a kind of question: isn't how antiquated should the language sound? 
because it's historical fantasy. And I did, I made the language formal, but I didn't uh, make it any more old fashioned than it needed to be. Um, but I wanted it still to sound Irish. Um, and so, so that's like a turn of phrase or kind of how the, the language is spoken. So for me, it was like I read the whole story aloud um, even before I submitted it to make sure that it felt natural and the the phrasing was was correct. Because sometimes I think when people try to um, have Irish people in stories or uh, sometimes we sound like we're drunk pirates or... Right, they resort to a really cheap, yes. Yes, or we sound like Yoda and we speak completely backwards. So, and there is an element of truth in that, which is why people do that. Um, but it isn't maybe as obvious as sometimes um, what you would, would read or see on TV shows or whatever. So I really wanted it to sound Irish and and for the cadences and the, the rhythm to be correct. So reading aloud was very important. So I'm very excited about um, that there is an audio book being done. Um, it should be out by the end of September. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing someone read it to me. <laughs> Did you get an Irish narrator for it? Uh, well, that, that is what I have. I well, I have asked for an Irish um, narrator because I think just see even just the names, <laughs> even though there is the pronunciation guide at the start, you know, I can't even imagine how someone not from Ireland would tackle all the names and the place names and um, and all of that. So hopefully, we get a, an Irish narrator. Yeah, that would be brilliant. I love my narrator, but there is one character's name he consistently says wrong, and it gives me conniptions. Um, oh, yeah. and, but he's he's brilliant. So like, it's it's such a nit to pick. Uh, so, but uh, it's still like you know you know how it is, right? Like this is your this is your 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 project, right? This has been with you for a long time, and it has to be perfect. And uh, that is, of course, you know why publishers get so you know upset with us sometimes. They're just like, you guys need to calm down, you writers. Uh, but uh, you know how it is. Um, this is a couple people sort of asked the same question here. So I'm going to ask the Orion version of it since Corey's asked a few questions. When it comes to getting uh, together sources and references, how do you decide what's worth keeping uh, and what doesn't necessarily make it into the final draft? Mm. Uh, okay, well, um, I suppose I didn't have loads of sources, so um, that was sort of made it a little bit easier. Um, and then also it's looking through the lens of the person who wrote it. So we have the story um, being told through the ancestors of one of the characters in my book, but it was written 200 years later. So it's family propaganda. Sure. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so that's the lens that you have to, to look at it. Um, it. You know, it's an epic uh, story that they've asked, they paid someone to make on their behalf. And then the other flip side is, um, it was the, the the poets or the bards that were with the Vikings that were involved in some of the the wars and they would write about the characters and then it's told through their perspective. And so generally you kind of, when you put the two together, you get those common things. And so you think, well, they're probably the truest things if these two different perspectives have the same thing and then everything else you have to think about why they would say that. Um, certainly, if, if I um, I've, like, I've researched other Irish um, periods of history, and every province in Ireland had its own sort of key monastery that would record the events of the time, and so they are highly influenced by what province they're from, and they're normally on the side of the king from their province. So then you get very different entries about the exact same uh, events. And so, yeah, so that's, that's part of being a historian. It's, it's kind of trying to examine why why they would say that, what's their motivation. Gormla is not a popular character in either um, either of the sources that I, that I read. Um, and then, you know, so you can have fun like why, why was she not popular? What was she up sure. to? Um, and then you can have, well, I think I had a bit of fun with that. Yeah, it's fun to sort of triangulate the truth through a lot of those sort of conflicting things, right? Uh, and it, and it's hard because sometimes you don't have the opposite perspective, right? Like I have a running joke that I'm I'm a Caligula apologist, 
because the only, you know, uh, sources we really have about him are from people who would naturally have hated him, right? Roman aristocrat. <laughs> so like, was he really that bad or was it just really hard on, on the Roman aristocracy? And is that really that bad? I don't know. Um, but there's like, it's hard to find something to really triangulate that with, except, you know, we know he was really well liked for those first couple of years. So, hmm. Uh, and it's, it, it ultimately you have to make a choice, right? You have to like decide like, how is the story going to be, right? And, and there's eventually that kind of, you know, that, that last step you have to take as the author deciding, here's all the pieces that I've got for this puzzle. And some of them are missing, so I'm gonna have to like paint my own. And, um, and that sometimes in, uh, will involve picking like which historical, you know, I, I hate this Howard Zinn word, but narrative, right? Uh, you wanna you wanna sort of stake your claim with, um, because ultimately, you know, the story has to be served, right? Um, for my part, at least, I'm very cognizant of like I just eventually have to like make that last step, um, you know, in my own writing when I borrow from whatever, right? Whether that's a direct reference or if that's like you know, riffing on an episode and disguising it as science fiction, you know, when it really, it's a bit of, you know, Byzantine medieval history or something that I've just painted over. Um, let's see, uh, we got maybe, let's do like two more. Ali asks, uh, do you have any favorite paintings uh, or artists that depict Irish myth that have inspired you? Um, God, let me think. Um, oh, I'm so bad at retaining names when it comes to art, but there's a very famous painting, um, which is when Strongbow has come to Wexford, and it's, I think it might be called the Marriage of Aoife, Strongbow and Aoife, um, which is a very is a famous painting. Um, if you put Strongbow and Aoife painting, hopefully the the correct one will come up. Um, but there's lots of beautiful art, like in, in Ireland. I mean, you you can walk down the street and there'll be a mural on the wall of Manana McLear. There's lots of sculptures in Ireland as well. Um, so I kind of quite like that art as opposed to formal paintings in a museum um, because it feels a bit more natural, I suppose. Um, and for me, I just, I don't know, there's a lot of music as well that's about all these myths and legends and I love listening to those as well. Um, but yeah, like Irish mythology is, you know, it is the less well-known of maybe like European mythologies, I would say. Uh, a lot of people know Irish folklore, which is like banshees and leprechauns, but not so much the mythologies. So, I mean, yeah, you go to any museum and you'll see paintings that reference Greek mythology and Roman gods and Greek gods. Um, you don't see that so much with um, with Irish mythology. It's just, it's just not so well known and it's maybe because Ireland was a conquered nation, um, hasn't maybe had the same um, kudos, maybe, that some of the other European mythologies have had. Yeah, so and some of it is like yeah. geographic, right? It's maybe a little bit more peripheral. It like, you know, it doesn't, it's not right on the Mediterranean, but it certainly has been overlooked. Same with like, um, like Eastern European stuff, right? Like I, my, one of my best friends is Polish. And so like the sort of pre-Christian sort of Slavic stuff, just not something that, um, you know, uh, we're very cognizant of, I think. Yeah, well, all those mythologies are there. And I think that's why it's a wonderful period of time we're having now where lots of these older mythologies are are being explored and being written about, um, as opposed to, you know, kind of always being Greek and uh, Norse. Um, and I just think it's because I don't know, the classics get studied in school. And so people are drawn to the stories that they hear first. Sure. Um, so I think it's, it's an interesting period of time um, where other mythologies are are starting to come out. Um, you know, obviously we've got Ronnie's book uh, is coming out, but I mean, I think last year I read a novella by Aliette de Bodard, which was Fireheart Tiger, which was Vietnamese mythology inspired. And, you know, I, that's wonderful. I, I, I love reading all, all the mythologies because they're all so interesting and you can see the similarities um, in so many of them as well. Yeah, no, I think it's great too. I'm in a weird spot, right? Because of course everyone's done the Greco-Roman thing to death, but I come by it honestly as an Italian. So it's, yeah. uh, it's a little bit of an awkward, awkward spot to be in. But Corey has left us with one final, I think, pretty awesome question, because we talked about mm -hmm. Gaite a little bit before uh, we got on the stream, I think. Uh, it might have been during. Um, and he, uh, Kay talks about his historical fiction, uh, his work as being historical fiction, like a quarter turn towards fantasy. Would you say yours has got a little bit more than a quarter turn or a little bit less? 
Ooh, yes, because actually we were talking about this book just before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is, is his book that is kind of Celtic um, mythology inspired. Um, so I would say it is a bit more of a turn than that because um, but then I don't know I, when I read that I did feel that there was a lot of fantasy in that book as well um, but I'm going to say more maybe not so much in book one but certainly the magical and the fantasy elements build up in books two and three because in the first book you know everyone's trying to be quite safe and um, one of the groups want to stay in hiding and not let anyone know that they're still there and the other group um suppose their magic is they're noticing that their magic is beginning to fade and so they're kind of beginning to question their place in Ireland and so we've got that that's kind of where they are at the start of the book um so but yes but that will that will build yeah that is awesome so it is the children of gods and fighting men by my friend Shauna here Shauna Wallace I put links in the description to both the US and the UK uh releases because they're coming out at different times and uh but i think you said the ebook was going to be available in the first september everywhere right yes yeah all right so folks that may be your best bet in the immediate future because the first of september is almost here shauna thank you uh thanks for being here this was awesome i really appreciate you coming on oh thanks christopher thanks for having me on i'm a big yeah. fan of your books um so yeah it was lovely to to speak to you and to to ronnie well right back at you and i'm looking forward to reading the book myself uh i really need to bully our publisher to giving me a copy uh, i should have done that sooner than I have. But uh, thank you too to all of you who are watching us this evening. Uh, thank you for tuning in and we will see you all again very, very soon. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, stay well. Bye.